So good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Malcolm Prin. I work for Intel, and uh, I joined Intel in 2015, in January. And since about March of 2015, I've worked pretty much exclusively on this Intel Quark microcontroller software interface. So yeah, after about a year and a bit, I thought I'd try and give some description or discussion about the sort of thing that we're doing in, inside an Intel. Um, so I'm really hoping that most of you have got the question of what is QMSI. Um, if you don't, this is probably going to be a bit boring for you. But yeah. So just sort of to begin with, so QMSI is, so it's a hardware abstraction layer. It's written in C, and it's for Intel Quark microcontrollers. Uh, so as of version 1.1, there's around 100,000 lines of code inside there. Uh, version 1.0 had like 25,000 lines, so we, you know, it's just getting bigger all the time. Um, that's just code. We've also got like 25,000 lines of comments and stuff, so it's, it's relatively well documented. Um, it supports most of the Intel Quark microcontrollers. It doesn't support one of them. Um, I'll give you a reason why later on. Uh, because they're microcontrollers and obviously they have very limited amount of space and memory and stuff, uh, one of the main objectives that we have for this, this abstraction layer is that uh, we want to try and, as much as possible, give functionality, but in a small a possible code space. And then also because microcontrollers wouldn't be anything if they didn't have any sort of low power functionality, we've also got um, some low power functionality tailored to each different microcontroller provided as part of QMSI. So that's what it is, but how does QMSI fit into the grander scheme of things? Like if a new developer was coming along and they wanted to build some application and stuff like that, how would they go about the whole process of you know, getting the hardware, building software, and doing all that stuff? So that's sort of what this slide is kind of trying to show you. So it's partially the agenda. It's also partially just to show you where you are in progressing. Um, so obviously the first step, whenever you're, if you're doing a new application or something, is you've got to try and evaluate your hardware options to see what suits your application type. So um, we've got uh, these Quark microcontrollers, which is Intel's you know, microcontroller option. Um, then we've got QMSI, which sits on top of that, which is our hardware abstraction layer. And then we've also got other, other components that we, we, it all sort of fits together in a package, which um, people can use, uh, pick and choose as they wish. So the different libraries is, is TinyCrypt, which does you know, encryption. There's this thing, IPPM, which is Intel Performance Primitives, which is sort of a DSP-like functionality. And then obviously we work pretty closely with Zephyr. So you've got your real-time operating system and you've got communication stacks. And there's also other OSs that uh, people are trying to port, thing, port QMSI across to you. And then there's also uh, integrated development environment, which is this Intel System Studio for microcontrollers. So that's sort of just an, an initial the sort of things I'd like to talk to you today about. But so if you take the, say, say you're starting a new project and you want to build something and you've decided you want to choose an Intel Quark MCU and you search on the internet and you say, what are these things? Uh, you'll probably be greeted with this, uh, this slide, which just says, you know, it's, it's all our microcontrollers. Basically, this is targeting the things part of Internet of Things, right? Because you've got you know, servers, you've got gateways, and you have the actual microcontrollers at the edge. And so this is Intel's foray into, into the edge part of things. So, um, they, you know, as the pictures suggest, so they're, they're built, they have low power in mind when they're being designed by the hardware engineers. Uh, some people might scream at just seeing integrated security. What does that mean? But uh, for us currently, it's uh, authentication and encryption. So we have some things for that. And then the scalable architecture is uh, basically because these uh, Quark MCUs are, they're all Intel Pentium you know, processors. Uh, so you, you've got Intel architecture all the way up. If you, if you take the whole solution, you've got Intel architecture all the way from the edge up to your servers in the cloud. So scalable architecture. So just to give a quick mm, bit of an overview about the different MCUs that we have at the moment. So the first one is this Quark D2000. And basically, this is sort of like a really low-powered entry-level microcontroller. Um, 
it's got 32K of flash, it's got 8K of RAM, it's a 32 meg controller, uh, you know, it's clock speed is 32 meg and it's x86 based. Um, you can see as well, there's a bunch of IO and peripherals and stuff. So like standard things you'd find on pretty much most microcontrollers. So there's UART, PWMs, uh, there's some SPI, GPIO, RTC and stuff. And so this also comes in is part of a development kit. So you can buy it from I don't know, DigiKey or Farnell or whatever. And you can see there is the, the box and it comes with a nice form factor and it's also got sort of Arduino you know, support for the rails and stuff. So you can, you can use Arduino shields and stuff like that if you, if, you, if you wish. So that's sort of a really basic you know, sort of entry level thing. Uh, the next one, which is this SEC 1000, is like really beefy. It's like a much bigger brother version of the D2000. So whereas the D2000 has only got 8K of RAM, it's got 80K of RAM, whereas it only had 32K of flash, this has got 384K. This 384K is actually split over two flash controllers, so you've got two banks of 192K. The previous one, there was only the one core. This has actually got two cores, so it's a multi-core SSC. So there's the, there's the Intel one, which runs a 32 meg, and then there's also an Arc core. Well, Arc core means core, but so the Argonaut RISC core, uh, that also runs at 32 megahertz. And then again, you know, you've got pretty much most of the same peripherals that you would have on the, on the D2000, but in this case, you've also got the additional thing of the sensor subsystem, which is the ARC, and that's got its own peripherals. But then also, because there's multi-cores, you have to be able to, to talk to, you know, send messages between cores. So this interprocessor communications is dealt with, uh, there's a mailbox IP inside the there, so you can send messages between your cores if you want to do any sort of synchronization or message passing. There's also a USB controller on the on the SSC, and then sort of the the main sort of attraction of the whole C1000 is it's got this pattern matching engine. So I don't know if anybody's seen any of the videos or anything, but uh, it's on recent like the X Games. They have um, they have people, you know, doing snowboarding or, or BMXing, and whenever the people do it in real time, they've got these little SOCs strapped to the boards of the bicycles. And if they do a flip or whatever it is, then, you know, it, it matches that flip and it will send the data real time over to some ga gateway waiting along. And then currently in the, like in the X Games, they'll actually show the live stats of the, of the athlete as they're doing it. So that's sort of one of the, the really nice things about this one. But it's also quite a bit more complex comparison to the previous one. So depending on whatever you need for, you know, your, 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 your application decision, you choose one or the other, whichever is most appropriate. And then say you've done that and you say, okay, I've, I've chosen my, my SSC and now I want to go and I want to actually see what is this, this hell about because this hell is, hell is supposed to make life a lot quicker and easier for us, right? So just to hammer it home again, it's a hardware abstraction layer and what it is, basically we've got a whole bunch of APIs and they provide a sort of a standard interface. So if you're dealing between IPs, uh, your, your APIs will not, not be the same, obviously, but they'll be sort of similar enough and they'll offer similar sort of naming conventions and things like that. So it's sort of, you get a look in a field that you know, lives on through the different things. The APIs are consistent across the different MCUs. So if you develop something for like say a D2000, your API then, you know, or your code could just port across to the C1000 in most cases. Sometimes with, if the hardware is completely different, you, you need to change, but, but it provides as much as possible the, the same. So it sort of reduces any sort of time when you're developing for different hardwares. Um, as well in the, the API collection, we've got a whole bunch of bare metal examples. So if we have any of the IPs, you can just look into our examples directory and like, we'd have samples of how do you use the I2C controller or how do you use SPI or whatever. So there's a whole bunch of things that people can look at there. And again, so because these have got really small amounts of memory, um, we, you know, we're trying to minimize the, the usage of our code size as much as possible. We access all of our IPs as, as memory mapped IO, so it's kind of quick that way. Um, we don't do any dynamic linking or anything, so everything we do is static. So whenever you 
build your thing, it's that's the size of your application. It's not going to grow or shrink. And the whole library is larger than the size of the flash. But so we do garbage collection when you do compile time. So any unused functionality is removed from the application that's generated. So you you only use as much as you need to use. So it gives as much much space as for the for user applications. So here is just like examples of some of the different things that like QMSI covers. So you can see there's like all the different um, all the different IPs and peripherals and things. And then also there's other things like um, identification. So you can at runtime you can identify what SOC you're running on if you need to. I mean if you want to have one that can run on multiple ones and it can do different functionality based on them, that's it's possible, you know, if you don't want to do it at a compile time. And then there's also things like a bootloader and firmware upgrade. So from so if you so you get, so you get the sort of the overview of, of all the things that happens, and then pretending that you're curious, uh, you can look into because you can look into the bootloader bootloader or the ROM, and you can see all the sort of things that it does. So mostly what it so it does the initialization because obviously whenever it boots up because it's a because it's Pentium. Um, it starts off in like 8-bit real mode. So there's a bunch of code in there to transition it into 32-bit mode, so it's useful for us. Um, there's also trim code calculations, which I'll get to in a bit. They're, it's kind of important, but you know, just don't worry for now. Um, there's firmware update management. So we have like a you know, processor. It's a fork of DFU utils. So from version 1.1, what we did was we forked DFU utils and modified it so that you can use <coughs> DFU utils with UART as the transport layer. But then in version 1.2, we now have USB support. So we just have the original DFU utils as an option there. So you can do your device firmware update over USB or UART, depending on which one you want. And there's some host tools provided to do that. So the ROM has this capability inside it. And then the final one is this, this unbrick me thing, which uh, when we got our first boards, like, you know, there's, because you're dealing with microcontrollers, there's a chance that you can leave it in a bad state. So we added this little functionality in that if you, if you ever are in a bad state with your, your SOC or whatever, it will basically wait for a pin. So if a pin is grounded, it will just loop on that pin. So you can always get back in and you can save your SOC. So it's just a little bit of protection that, you know, we used and we think is quite handy. So the general flow of how things go when the when the, the microcontroller or the SSC starts, boots up at the start. So they all start off at a reset vector. And we've got, uh, we've got code in there. So again, the assembly startup. So you, you, you um, set up your GDT, so your, or your interrupts and stuff. You transition into 32-bit mode. You set up um, your cache, if it's on Quark SE. And also you set up your, your stack pointer. Then it goes into doing some prim primary peripheral setup, where it sets up the clock modes, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, and it does trim code calculations inside there as well. Then it does this little unbrick me bit where it will check and see if you need to like get in there so you can talk to, talk to it with OpenOCD and JTAG. And then it sets up your, um, your secondary peripherals where it sets up the whole IDT and the IRQs and things so it gets your interrupts ready. And then it gets to a split so there's the standard flow goes to the left, and then there's the update management mode goes to the right. So for the standard flow, what we have is if you, so you can see that the, the arc box is a slightly different color. And the reason why it is is because prior to version 1.2, if you're running on the Quark SC, we would kick off the arc as part of the ROM flow. But then we sort of realized that this wasn't, exactly great if you needed synchronization or anything. So now we've done from 1.2 on is we've actually removed that option from the ROM. So user applications now have the ability to start the arc themselves so that you can do your own synchronization instead. Um, so after that step, then this step now is starting the Lakemont core is, is, is common to all the SOCs. So basically it just jumps into your main. So as you know, embedded developers, you just start running from there. And then if, it, if there isn't an application flashed onto the SOC or, your, or if the user application actually finishes, it just goes into power down mode. So it can conserve battery. And this is sort of like a, if, you, if you are transporting your SOC or whatever and you're on battery mode, then you just go into power down mode to conserve battery life. 
going on to the other side of things with the with the boot manager flow. Basically, it just comes in uh, if if uh, it checks it checks for um, it's a compile time option and it also checks for flags, and it says, do I need to enter into sort of DFU mode? And if it does, then it will first set up flash controllers, then it'll do some sanitization of the bootloader section, and then it will actually enter into bootloader mode, which itself is quite a large body of work, so not for here. Um, so I was saying before about the sort of clocking capabilities of the SOCs. And so what you have on, on the Quark MCUs is for the main system clock source, you can have a selection of what you want to use the main system clock source as. So you can choose to either use um, an external crystal oscillator, which will be running at 32 megahertz, and it's obviously, it's, a, it's as accurate as your crystal is. Um, the downside of it is that it uses around four milliamps of current to operate on the crystal. So you have to sort of decide, are you in a situation where you need the sort of accuracy and can you expend this sort of power? If you can't, what we have is we've got a little silicon oscillator inside there and you can choose that to act as your main clock source. So the silicon oscillators, you can tell it to operate at 32 meg, 16, eight or four meg. And it also has prescalers, so you can prescale down from that. But the, so the sort of, and it uses only like 450 microamps at 32 meg, which will be quite a lot less. It's like an order of magnitude lower. But the accuracy is not as great. So this is where the sort of the trim codes come in, because if you, so part of the trim code process, is you've got to, you know, trim the oscillator. And uh, so the, if you don't do any of the calculations and you say, I want to operate at 32 megahertz, because the trim codes would be potentially wrong, it would be operating at, you know, 29 megahertz or something else, and then everything would break down because you're, you're expecting it to be one frequency, but it's not. So that's why the bootloader then does, um, does the trim code calculations so that it will set up all the correct trim codes for the different operating modes of the silicon oscillator. So if you change clocks, clock settings, it will be correct and it'll be what you're expecting. The final option that you would have for the system clock source is you can choose to have it operated off the RTC, so the external RTC crystal. So there's obviously you know, 32K crystal. And um, for these ones, it's obviously, it's if you're into sort of super low power modes where you have really long delays between needing to wake up, uh, that's when you'd use it. So these can all feed in as an option, so it's one at a time as your system clock source, and that's what you're your processor will run off of. But then also the peripherals, most of the peripherals are sourced from the system clock source. So like the examples given here are just ITC and SPI. And so what you have is you've got your system clock source running at whatever speed it's running and then you can assign a prescaler value to the, to the clock source which would then feed in as the clock source for whatever IP. So you could have your clock source running at 32 meg and you can prescale that down by like four or something and then your SPI will run at, um, at four, uh, eight meg instead. Um, and then also as part of sort of power states and all this you know, power modes and things, you can also enable or disable clocking for different IPs, uh, for different peripherals as you want. I was saying that most of the IPs are sourced from the system clock source. There are three that are sourced from the RTC clock source. So these are the RTC, obviously. The, the watchdog timer is on that, that, that sort of tree, and then also the always on periodic timer. So if anybody's ever dealing with those ones as opposed to the, any of the other ones, you could be wondering as to why registers aren't updating so, you know, in that sort of time. But that's most of that stuff we've sort of taken care of in the hardware abstraction layer instead. So then, um, so if you've got, like, or you're clocking down and stuff, then part of it is, is checking out uh, what sort of different power states. So I was saying that like each SOC, you know, Kimisai provides power states based on whichever SOC that you're working with. So D2000, it's, it's a pretty simple thing. Uh, it's got pretty simple power modes to go with it. So you're either in active mode or, you know, completely off. But so in active mode, you can go into hold mode, which will just halt the, the system clock, but it won't hold anything else. So everything else can keep on running. And it's sort of a really fast way but to just conserve a little bit of power while you're waiting for some, you know, some slow, short transaction to complete. And then when an interruptive request happens, then the whole system goes back into active mode. But then also you've got sort of deep sleep options where you can 
power down more and more clocks, and the more clocks you power down, the more power you would save, obviously. Um, so then the sort of options we've got in D2000 is that we, we've got, um, you can do deep sleep with no clocks at all, or deep sleep with uh, an RTC source. So the RTC source, you can wake up as, as, as RTC as your wake up source, or with the no clocks at all, it would be on um, like a comparator, you know, to, to wake up your, your SSC. So the, that one's really easy, and it's, you know, not that intimidating. But then when you go across to the, the C1000, it, you know, it starts to look a bit more, because you've got to start managing multiple cores now, so there's obviously a lot more choices and options you can have. But, you know, it's sort of almost analogous. So you've got C states, which is an Intel thing, right? So you, your C, C0 and SS0 is your, your active states, and then you've got similar things where C1 and SS1, where if you just do a halt, and then C2, LP, and C, you know, is where you start disabling more and more clocks to get lower and lower power. And then eventually you have like the sort of the lowest um, power consumption mode for, for C1000, where you, the low, if, if both are into C2 or SS2 mode, and then you can enter into lower power standby state, which is sort of, you know, as good as it gets. Um, so one final little thing about the actual, <laughs> the code. Uh, so this is just a little sample of how you'd actually use uh, QMSI in general. So at the top, this is all lifted from one of our examples. Um, so you can see we've got a little QMRTC config struct type at the top, we call it config. And inside we've got different options. So you set whatever your initial value, if you want uh, to have an alarm or a callback, and then your alarm value, like how long between alarms. And if you want user callback, and if you want to pass any user data and sort of a prescaler value. And then when you set up all your configuration options for whatever IP it is, they're all relatively similar, but they're obviously tailored for whatever IP you work on. But then you would do uh, register an interrupt request if you need interrupts, um, which is part of the, you know, just how the interrupt mechanisms work. And then you can enable, or you, you can start your, your um, clocking, because you, because on the, the clocking slide you can enable or disable different IPs on the clocks. And then finally, you can get around to set the config, uh, which just takes your parameter and also takes a, a, an enum of which instance of an IP you want to, to target. So, like if you, because, so with RTCs we only have, you know, the one at the moment, but if there were two or three RTCs, you could use the same function, but you would just change RTC zero to be RTC one or two or whatever, depending on which one you want to access. So it's sort of the same, and it will just handle multiple IPs instead. Um, one little thing about the the like set config functions and things like that. In in a lot of our functions, what we have is we've got a bit of parameter checking, but only if you're working in debug mode. So if you compile in debug mode, your applications will do some nice parameter checking for you. So if you put in wrong values. It will catch it and it'll say no, you're you're wrong. But then if you compile in release mode instead, it's it's not as forgiving. It will just assume that you're right, you know. So that because basically again, it reduces the code size because you're not doing any you know standardization or you're not checking anything, and it's, so it's faster and you know it's just all better. But it also has a bit of a dangerous side because if you put in wrong values, it'll you know have who knows what it'll do. But anyway, so, so that's sort of QMSI in general. So then moving along onto sort of the library side of things. Uh, so there's, so we have some, uh, we have Newlib as part of the thing. And so we provide a few, you know, system calls inside that. Uh, so one of the things we have is, is uh, Pico Printf, which is, um, it's like a modular, very tiny version of, of Printf. So what you can do is you can actually go in and, and at compile time you can disable certain options if you know you don't want to use it or you can even add stuff on at the end if you want to have your own versions but you'd have to write the code for that. Um, so currently what it does is supports DU, XX and S. So, you know, integers, hex and strings. Um, then we also have a puts and there is malloc and free there so you can do some dynamic stuff if you really need to but we, we don't but it, it is an option. And then we also have uh, asserts, which um, if you're interested, you can dig into the code. 
and you can change what happens on an assert behavior. So there's a few defines uh, which you do at compile time, and you can change what happens if 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 an assert is called. Um, then, if you have sort of say you say you've got an application and you 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 want to actually sort of run it on a board and sort of debug it a bit, and you know you you feel that you sort of like at that first sort of stage. Um, this is sort of the, the sort of the flow that you do. So you've got your hardware at the bottom, you've got whatever code that you've written. And then for the standard case with whatever like our reference boards and things is we've got um, open OCD is our communication method method. And you can either talk directly into open OCD or you can use GDB to do debug commands. You can set breakpoints, view memory, do all those sorts of things, whatever you need to do. Um, then the tool chains you know, a bit confusing, but so basically we've got two different tool chains. They're both based on GCC. So if you're compare, if you're compiling for Intel architecture, you just use normal GCC, and then if you're compiling for the Arc, we've got uh, Arc GCC. And these, the, all these tool chains and OpenCD and everything is provided as a as a standalone download. So you can just go into software intel.com, you know, ISSM tool chain only. And you can just download these for Windows or, or Linux, whatever you want. And you can just use them as, as on their own if you wish. So there's sort of the libraries that we have. And then, so, you know, because security is king, we, have a, we do some tiny crypt stuff as well. Um, so for the tiny crypt, basically, uh, as I was saying at the moment, it's all you know either encryption or, or authentication. So you've got you know some implementations of SHA and HMAC SHA for authentication, and then you've got your elliptical curves or AES if you're doing encryption stuff. So you can you know use whatever is appropriate for whatever you want. So, but it's up to you. it's up to you to to use whatever has been implemented. So then moving on towards this, the DSP-like stuff. So what we have is because, because there's no floating point unit on the, on the SOCs, um, basically we just use fixed points instead, much like Kinsys or other people would do. Um, so you've got Q15 and Q31 formats. And then there's a bit of floating point emulation or simulation. But it's, you know, because there's no actual um, Floating point unit, it's all in software, so it takes, takes a lot of space and takes a lot of time to do that sort of thing. Um, but we have, so for the DSP like things, you've got a whole bunch of different uh, functional groups. So, you know, fast math or matrix functions or transforms, whatever you need. Um, each function that you use obviously would increase the whole size of whatever application you're using, so you have to be ju judicial. Um, there's, they, there's a, it is optimized as much as possible, but some functions take Two kilobytes. Some some functions take a few hundred bytes of memory. It all depends on the actual, you know, the hard requirements of the functions and how much they use. Um, so that's, you know, things that are there. Uh, there is, like I was saying, there is the floating point library. Uh, this is only for Lakemont processors, uh, and it just emulates floating point operations, you know, using these hardware integer instructions instead. Um, so yeah. You can read it yourselves, but you know, it's however QX format goes. And so <sighs> pretend you know you've got like your hardware, you've got your the hell, you've got your little application using TinyCrypt and you've got all these things going on, you know, left, right and center. And then you also want to do some com stacks on top of that. Could potentially write your own, but it's much easier to use an RTOS instead. That they've done all the hard work for you, right? So, you know, we work really closely with with Zephyr, and we're their um, now we're their their um, hardware driver of choice when it comes to Intel architect uh, Intel SOCs and microcontrollers. And then they support all of the things. I'm sure everybody's heard a lot about it, this whole conference with Zephyr, where they do. You know, a lot of different comms protocols like six low pan and things like that. Uh, so then, as a developer, you can choose if you want. You can either do all of the stuff yourself, like you can download QMSI yourself, you can get all the libraries yourself, you can get Zephyr, you know, TinyCrypt, everything. You could do all of that, and it will all work. It all works together. 
Um, or instead, what you can do is you can choose to use the Intel System Studio for microcontrollers. And basically this bundles everything together. So you just have one download and we'll do all the, all the work for you to make sure everything's in correctly. Uh, so it's, it's based on Eclipse. So anybody who's familiar with Eclipse should be fairly, should be fairly familiar with this. Um, it has the debugger, so it has like OpenOCD and GDB integration built into it. It also has some register view stuff built into it, so you don't need to uh, query everything individually. Um, on Windows only, there is some extra drivers for USB support, but it's not required on Linux. On Linux, it's slightly better. And then you can see the nice, pretty Eclipse thing in action, where you've got you know sort of code on there. If you're doing if you're doing uh, debugging, so you've got code on the left. You've got disassembly on the right. So you can see the actual uh, you know assembly instructions. And then at the bottom there's a register view, so you can, if you are stepping through your application and you're wondering why something isn't working, you can always stop at any point. You can go down to the register view and you can just say, what's the actual status of, you know, my UART registers? And it will show you everything inside there. So it's pretty good, you know, but it's, it's pretty standard, I'd say, at this stage. So then the sort of final bit is, <laughs> How would you use all of this stuff together? You know, how would you take everything that's in a package and, and then go forth with it and do what you want? So, as I was saying before, we've got a whole bunch of like existing applications in bare metal. Um, Zephyr comes with their own ex you know, sample applications as well, but here we have things of how exactly we would use RIPs in whatever situations. Um, there's a few classics, like Blinky, you know just in case you ever need to blink later on and all forever. We've also got Hello World, otherwise we'd, you know, we'd be shot. And um, then also some specific power examples for the different SOCs, because again, the hardware is different, so controlling the power modes in them is different. And then also um, some Grove Shield examples as well, where you know, Grove Shields are little sensor kits and you can use them and do what you wish. So, if you've Done all that, and you think maybe I'd like to, you know, have a look at QMSI. There's a couple places you can go where you want to get it. Uh, so the first place, would, well, one of the places, is you can go along to this Intel Developer Zone, and you can just download the latest bundle for ISSM on whatever platform you choose, and that will give you, you know, everything: tool chains, code, Zephyr, all this stuff, um, or you can go to GitHub. So prior to version 1.1, we, we had GitHub. We were hosting on 01.org, um, but then we sort of moved to our own little GitHub project instead. So what we've got now in GitHub is, you know, we've got QMSI project, we've got the bootloader project, and we also have the DFU utils for the UART-based uh, updating. And, you know, it's, it's there. You're free to do whatever you want copy it, fork it, who cares, you know, s contribute to it. That would be best of all, right? Um, so that's, you know, the link up there. Feel free to go along. And then if everything else goes terribly wrong and you don't know where to turn to, uh, we do have a community page, uh, which is fairly actively looked after by some people inside. Um, so there's the, the link for that, and you, you know, if you're welcome to ask questions about <laughs> Quark stuff, you know, like uh, D2000 or C1000, whatever things, you know, pertinent to that, like. Um, and then generally we'll, we'll answer as quick as we can or, or get onto somebody who can answer you. But yeah, so otherwise, this, this little bit of legal stuff, and uh, thanks everybody for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Oh. <laughs> Maybe this is more like a Zephyr question, but uh, <coughs> do you know the, the power management in, in Zephyr? Does it, is it working? Is it using the, the, the QMSI uh, power interfaces? That's Pedro is nodding yes. Was that? Pedro is nodding yes. Oh, okay. And we're working on it now, and we should get it the next revision. Next revision of Zephyr? Of QMSI and Zephyr. Okay. So uh, are you doing the both sides? Yeah, like we work so closely with the guys, like we're, you know, meetings with them like all the time.
So really tightly you know, integrated there. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm working with a group uh, that they want to have a batch for a demo. Okay. And um, so I uh, proposed this idea of uh, copying the DEF CON design. Yeah, I was just about to say, yeah. yeah it's so cool, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty it's good. Cool. X86 and um, so the, the problem I came across is that they want Live C and maybe not a full Linux core uh, uh, kernel, but, um, but it seems that the D2000 will not and make it for us with its 8K of memory. Sure, yeah. Is the C1000 then a better choice for that? Well, the C1000 definitely got a lot more memory, right? So you've got 80K of RAM, and you've got um, the 2 by 192K of flash. If that's enough for Linux or not. So positive no, using Live C, they wouldn't work on the C1000 either. The problem is not that. The problem is that neither of them have an MMU, so you don't have paging. Impression that there was a quark that, that was well, so yeah, there yeah, are it's quarks um, like the the X one thousand, like the Galileo or, or the Edison. They they run Linux things, but they're they're not the MCU side of things. They're you know much 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 beefier. Like. So in general, if you need to run a classic OS, uh, you divide between microcontroller MCU products and uh, microprocessor products MPU products. So for running Linux, you need an MPU class. Uh, in the Intel uh, catalog, that at the moment is the X1000. That's the one that the X1000. Yes. And that one has external uh, DDRs, so you can switch RAM as you want. You can have compact flash. But it'll be a heavier, more power hungry uh, design. If it's for a batch, do you really need Linux? I don't want Linux, but. Um, yeah, the guys want to port their software on there that's already working to live C. So it's 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 a conflict that we haven't sorted out. Uh, maybe put X X thousand on there. Maybe try to copy as much of the DefCon design. Do, do it in a winter winter situation. <laughs> <laughs> the DefCon guys they basically took a day at two thousand. They develop everything in bare metal QSI. And they said that for their needs it was perfect. Like just a C runtime environment and access to the IO. Very simple, very tiny code. You can always drop something in email maybe and check. Drop who email? <sighs> the Com guys. Well, uh, or us. You write us. Put you in contact with the DEF CON guys, and maybe we can see what we can do. Hmm. Anybody else? Curious, ah. what, what's the price point for, for the microcontrollers? The price point. Um, so, on if you go into like um, DigiKey or Mauser, I think it's it's around is it five? No. no, 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 no. no. Uh, you can go, you can check it on DigiKey okay. or, or, or wherever it's like. Yeah, I think like, I think it, in singles, it's like, if, you, if you're doing the C1000, I think for singles, it's like, I don't know. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's a number X. <laughs> and then it, if you're willing to buy in batches of 2000, it's like, you know, you get like, a, I don't know, you know, 20% discount or something, whatever the X is like, but it's... Yeah. I but think for the D2000, it was like $7 for one, or $4 for 3000 <laughs> okay. per unit. Yeah, but it, the prices should be on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this middle controller, it include SOC or other system. So, all those things is called a middle controller. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, sort of use the term a bit. So this is the SOC is the, the whole package, right? So the SOC contains all of the things inside of it, whereas the microcontroller is maybe just one small part of that. All right, if nobody has anything else. Oh. Uh, so 
use case would be any Internet of Things <laughs> thing. So, like some of the things you you might have seen before would um, be uh, like at the X Games. They have these these ones in particular. They have them on like snowboarders and BMXers and stuff. And as people do tricks, it shows you in real time. You know their speed and their velocity and, and uh, their rotate angular rotation and stuff. There was also um, our CEO did a demonstration at CES last year. We had a he had a button on his suit, and it showed him walking. You know, he it showed his stats as he's walking around for the whole presentation and stuff. So, yeah, what do you need for Internet of Thingy things? Yeah, near us or okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>